That's all right. Okay, so my name is Steve Terelmus, and um, I've been with XBM for several years. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I've been in working with business projects for probably about 20 years. I actually kind of cut my teeth in the business world in the uh, early aught years around the energy industry. This is back in the days when um, California was experiencing the energy crisis, and uh, there was a bunch of energy marketing firms in, in Texas that were having fun, maybe a little too much fun. Um, but what resulted out of that was, of course, uh, a lot of regulation, which then required a lot of software. And so I was working with software in the energy industry, and I was working for a software company that um, would build the software. And it was very waterfall. Right? We, would, we would go in, we would have several weeks of conversations, several weeks of scoping, several weeks of negotiations. And then there would be this just this really big buildup for a period of six to eight months. And then there would be this release. And of course, by the time you released it, um, what you released was not what people wanted anymore. And then all throughout that six to eight month period, everybody decided that they wanted so much other stuff. Um, and so I kind of came out of that world into the Atlassian world, which is really like, I don't know, <laughs> it's coming out of the dark ages into, into the light, right? And I was just blown away by how quickly uh, people were iterating using the uh, Atlassian software. And it was really neat to me to see that uh, the the amount of velocity that people were pulling things out, and I was like, I'm, "This is this is a lot of fun. I want to get involved in this." Um, so I don't know if anybody has actually seen the Atlassian stock price lately. It's it seems to be on its own trajectory. Um, it's kind of following SpaceX on its way up to the skies somewhere. We don't know where. But when I look at it, I think, "My goodness, this is interesting." Because there's a parallel here between what I see when I'm teaching classes and when I'm working with. Uh, companies. Um, I sit down with people, uh, with companies, or I sit there and talk to people in a class. And um, I say, okay, so how's it going? The problems are, you know, look, I got to figure out how to do something here in Atlassian, but really I've got to figure out how to get my company in order because um, I've just inherited uh, something from from uh, somebody left and I'm now the new admin and, and what I inherited is just an absolute mess. Or we've been around for so many years and our database is such a mess. Um, and about four years ago, somebody said, we should clean this up. And so somebody said, yeah, one of these days we'll get on that. And then four years later, it, it's now like four times as big of a mess. And, and really what it is, is it's a reflection. The two are running in parallel, right? As Atlassian continues to do a successful job, of course, their stock price will continue to grow. But what that represents in our companies is it rep represents this idea of you're coming in with one avenue in one area. And then as that works out very well, other people start to see it and they start jumping on it and jumping on it and jumping on it. So what I tell people in my classes and my teach uh, people and consultant people is, what you're seeing in that Atlassian price is a reflection of what you're seeing in your company. And it's going to happen. If you are new to Atlassian, if you're moving from another tool into Atlassian, you need to get ahead of this wave because it's going to hit. Um, at first, it may not seem like anybody knows about Atlassian in your company. Uh, it may seem like you're the only champion of Atlassian in your company, but it doesn't take very long for people to start recognizing what it can do and it grows quick. Um, I have people that I will start off an instance with them with a certain number of licenses. Within a few months, they're asking me to update the license and double it. Because as soon as people see it, they're like, oh, I want to be in there. That, that looks really cool. I want to check that out. How can I do it? Because Atlassian has structured itself in such a way that it empowers the users. It does have a lot of good form and a lot of good structure to it. But when you actually get to the point where things are being accomplished and things are being done, it's the users that are doing it. It's the users that are building their own visualization tool. Anybody that's ever built a large piece of software knows the complexity of actually trying to get information out of that software, right? And you have to go and find Bob because Bob's the only guy that knows how to technically write this report that takes him about three weeks to do because everybody's going to Bob, right? When you deal with Atlassian, it's like, no, everybody can build their own filters. Everybody can build their own dashboards. Everybody can build their own documents and spaces, and everybody can build their own macros in those documents. And suddenly, it starts empowering users. So when we think about Atlassian governance, we want to follow that example that Atlassian's already set for us. We want to implement a governance process that is actually going to empower the users. We want the users to motivate the governance process. Of course, you need to have some control. Of course, you need to have the internal champions. You need to have the people that can write the check. 
no doubt. But you don't want everything coming from the top down because that's not what got you successful in Atlassian to begin with. What got you successful was users getting excited about it. And so we want to try to have that same approach when we come to governance is how do we get the users involved? How do we get them excited? How do we get them being the internal champions of the governance structures that we're trying to set up? So as it grows, we're not out there actually trying to herd the thousands and thousands of new sheep that just continue to keep coming into the instance every day. They're actually standing up and saying, no, this is a good idea. Why don't we try this? Have you looked at this? They're actually talking to each other and coming up with ideas amongst each other and then coming to us as groups instead of individuals. And this is incredibly important because as you all know, if you buy an Atlassian product and then you want to buy an add-on or something like that, you have to have the number of users in the add-on as you do in the product. So if only a few people want that add-on, that becomes a really difficult situation. But if users are motivated, if users are engaged, then suddenly they're coming to you in groups of people. And now, oh yeah, this makes sense because 20% of our users actually want this add-on. And so hopefully what we can do today is, hey, come on in. Ian. Hopefully what we can do today is we can talk a little bit about how do we make this transition to chaos, from chaos into structure. Um, when I teach in my classes, I always tell people what you're trying to do when you build a JIRA project is you're trying to take the chaos of the database and turn it into some sort of structural order that makes sense to your users. And so perhaps here in governance today, we can do the same thing. Maybe we can take the chaos that has become the, the excitement and uh, the growth that you're experiencing in your company and other people are experiencing in their companies around Atlassian tools and actually get that to a place where we can harness it and use it for uh, a little control, a little bit of user acceptance, a little bit of user excitement, and um, even maybe user ownership. So. so when I think about governance, I've always tried to think, what, what exactly is Atlassian governance? If I were to boil it down to one slide, what would that slide look like and what would I try to convey? And so um, those of us that were here last year might chuckle a little bit because um, we've kind of uh, had this concept of this idea of Atlassian governance being a facilitator of the power of your company. And what does that mean? How, how do we get there, right? Um, so last year, we put together a pretty crude diagram that showed a rocket taking off in a control tower because we wanted this idea. And it looked kind of silly, but then we actually found somebody that could really draw and we actually tried to put it together again because the idea was great. We just, we just didn't have anybody in the company that could do a, do a good diagram. So here's the idea that, that I view kind of governance as. It's really two facets, okay? There is the control tower like you have in a rocket ship. You know, Houston, we have a problem, right? Or, uh, or, or a control tower in an airport or something like that. And, and that is super critical. And there's a lot of things that are very strict there and they're very tied down and they're very controlling, right? But the purpose of the control tower is never the control tower, ever. The second the purpose becomes the control tower, you completely lose focus of what you're doing. The purpose is the rocket. The purpose is the plane. The purpose is the trajectory. That is your company. That's your company making money. And one of the reasons why Atlassian is so powerful, one of the reasons why Atlassian does so well in companies is it understands this idea of we are not here to be the tail that wags the dog. We are here to support and push and implement the actual power that we're trying to do as a company. If a user is in Jira, if a user is in Bitbucket, we don't want them wasting all their time in Jira and in Bitbucket because the more they spend time in our software, the less they're making money for their company, the less the rocket's going. We want them to get in, get quickly. We even want to automate as much as we possibly can so we can get the rocket going. So it's this, it's this duality of incredibly important things where you can't live without either one. If you have just a rocket with no control tower, right? That's when you just, you see a lot of what's going on, right? You got everybody coming into the instance and everybody wants to be an admin and all these things are going every which direction. It's like a rocket without a control tower. If you have a control tower and that's all it is, then it's like, well, you're going to do this, and we got to do this, and we got to do this, but that doesn't work for my project. That doesn't work for me. And eventually people start saying, I I'm not really sure I understand how to use this product or why this product is helping me. I'm spending all day clicking through statuses, or I'm spending all day trying to jump through hoops, or I'm spending all day trying to find my admin so that he can do something for me. And so it can't be the control tower either. 
But at the end of the day, if you had to pick between one of those two things, it's got to be the rocket because that's where your company makes business. So the control tower needs to be a framework that is promoting certain activities that allows the rocket to accomplish what it needs to do. And what does the rocket need to do? Well, there's a couple of ideas up here, aligning strategies across the organization. This is a very powerful thing, especially in organizations that are siloed or that have grown up in different areas or two different groups that are merging together because one company bought another company or something like that. You need to align those strategies. You need to improve your processes. Um, a lot of times as things grow organically, and a lot of our businesses do grow organically, the processes are a mess and you need to have somebody in there that can actually improve those processes. Providing efficiency so that we're actually, like I mentioned before, you're actually working, you're making money for your company, you're doing good stuff, but at the same time, you're, uh, you're not wasting a lot of time, you're, you're providing efficiencies. So these are some of the, some of the uh, trajectories, some of the rockets that we think, but I'm sure there's many others that you can think of as you think about your organization. Uh, so how do we get these going and how do we get them going in, 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 in formation, like, like this beautiful picture here showing, right? So I was sitting there in the hotel room the other day thinking, well, gee, wouldn't it be nice if I came up with a nice little acronym for rocket. And so I just started writing down words that I could think of that had these letters in it. And then I'd go to the, uh, Google and I, there's like a website, you can throw a bunch of letters in and it'll tell you what words you can make out of those letters. And I really wasn't getting anywhere, but then it just hit me. Um, and I came up with these, and I, I actually think they, they represent really well the goals that you want to try to move toward when you're thinking about governance. Um, representation. Obviously, you have to have representation in any governing body or in any governing uh, solution. And who that representation is, is going to be very important to determining whether or not, that, uh, whether or not that's successful, right? Openness. Um, one of the things I love about Atlassian tools is they actually, I talk to people in classes and I talk to people when I'm consulting and they actually have difficulty sometimes with Atlassian tools because the tools themselves are forcing their company to be more open than they've ever been before. And so they're not used to that. And it's like, no, it's okay. When you build a filter in Jira, it's okay. You can share that filter because Jira is smart enough to know who can see it and who can't see it and that kind of thing. And suddenly it's like, oh, well, try this. Okay, well, let's talk about that. And suddenly you start having this open conversation going on. And so that has to, again, carry into governance. And it's really important to have that open dialogue so that there's a lot of activity. And we're going to talk a lot today about openness because if we're going to be successful, if we're going to mirror in governance what Atlassian has successfully done with their software, we have to allow people that aren't connected to be able to easily be connected. And we want to structure our governance framework so that it can be done that way. Brian's going to be talking a lot about that later this afternoon. Coordination, right? Now that we have an openness, how do we actually keep that openness from being too chaotic? It actually has some sort of structure or coordination around it. How do we have this person and this person and this person, even though they're from different divisions, maybe even completely different groups within a company, right? One's software, one's HR, one's PMO. How do we get them working together from a Atlassian governance standpoint? Knowledge. Again, a great, great opportunity in Atlassian tools is the knowledge, especially with Confluence. Confluence becomes a parking place for public knowledge bases. And so people can, as they learn, they're no longer trying to figure out, well, where do I replicate this? Um, one of the biggest complaints I get from people when I talk to them is I've just come in and uh, admin left and he left about a month before I came in and I have no idea what he did. And every time I hear that, I'm like, well, wouldn't it been so much better if that previous admin had just captured some of the stuff in Confluence and just left it behind as breadcrumbs for the next people? And so these artifacts, these uh, documents, these things that we want to do, we want to leave that behind for people so that as a whole, our company can always be much smarter than any of the individual parts. And of course, expertise. We need the people that know what they're doing. Um, we need to find those people. We need to share those people around the organization. Um, this is George. He's a great person in this particular area here, but nobody else knows about him because George is being sequestered in a corner. There's no open knowledge. There's no open openness. There's no coordination. There's, there's no representation. And so this idea of how do we get that person out into the open so that we can utilize his expertise? Because what we want to see is we want to see George times two and George times three and George times four. So expertise and expanding expertise. And then of course, teamwork. 
Um, teamwork is the idea of, in my opinion, all of this together with people motivated by a vision. In order to have successful teamwork, you need to have two things. You have to have someone who can cast a good vision, and then you have to have the rest of the people that are excited about it. When people are excited about a, a vision, problems are worked together as groups to be overcome. They're not things that people sit around and complain about because the vision sets the uh, forward goal and people all move toward that. And to me, that's what teamwork is. To me, teamwork is when we're sitting here on the launching pad, trying to build our framework to promote our future success, somebody is out there telling us what that rocket is going to do and how incredible it's going to be done. Even if we don't even exactly know yet how it's going to get there, somebody's casting that vision for us. And that's what, that's what really supports teamwork. So this concept, this overall concept, there's a lot of things there. I suppose as if I continue to do my word search, I could have come up with some other great words, but those were the words that I came up with that I thought really kind of met the need. And then, of course, they, they fit the acronym as well, too. But um, looking at this in your organizations, um, what are some of the things that you guys see in here that... Um, that maybe, I don't know, maybe you would say, yeah, that, that's something we need. Or maybe there's other words. I mean, maybe think, thinking about these words, what are, what are some other words that you guys would think as we want to expand this concept of governance in our organization, what are some of the things that we really need to focus on? Or did I, did I get them all? Yes. Coordination. Coordination. Not in our company, but in the companies that I work with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so explain like a little bit, maybe a scenario or something you saw with that. Oh, I... Some of the companies I work with, that um, management has an idea and other people don't quite understand that idea yet, or when two managers aren't talking to each other, just um, you know, meetings at the wrong times about the wrong things, as opposed to meetings that would really get the vision streamlined for everybody, um, mm -hmm. and knowing when to have that meeting and when not to. So, but I think that comes down to coordination. Yeah, um, yeah, meetings are always. <laughs> <laughs> meetings are the, um, I don't know, meetings are the drag on the rocket, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they, they are the things that, that everybody hates. They are necessary. I mean, let's, let's, not, let's, let's not be uh, too fantastical in our thoughts of where this rocket can go, but they are necessary. But at the same time, we want to keep them to a point where they're actually useful. Um, Atlassian helps with this. And we're going to actually talk about that today. How can you actually curtail meetings using Atlassian tools? Because even in the governance platform, Right, Because here's what's going to happen. When you're going to talk to your company about implementing governance, one of the first things people are going to think of is, oh, great, here's another weekly meeting that I've got to stick on my calendar, right? So no, you don't need that, right? We've got tools already. We, we can build this without having to have a ton of meetings. Anybody else have any other thoughts on that? Ideas, things that you've seen, would like to see? Or, or maybe stuff that people are doing really well. Yeah, I mean, have... Have, have, have any of you guys actually experienced some of these and, and seen some good success in your company with them? So we, have, we have a constant thing on the improved processes and provide efficiency. Mm -hmm. Like, we have very smart people, but they... Um, yeah, that's fine. We actually have. Um, we'll take workflow as an example. So in order to make the system scale out, we don't want to create workflows for every team. Right. So we may have a workflow that's used by hundred different projects, maybe more. Mm -hmm. um, but getting a change to that process involves the coordination of all of those, those teams. Mm -hmm. um, and we used to use that as a bit of a weapon against change by saying, okay, you go out and speak to all of those, those admins of those projects and then get approval and come back to us and we'll do it. But now we've And hopefully it never makes it around. <laughs> again, so it's used as a weapon, right? Yeah. So now it goes the other way where we know who they are. So we will coordinate that change because ultimately people are using our system to deliver products and if they collectively see there's a better change. And the result of that now is that we filter those requests and send them out as a batch and the number of people that come back and say, I'm glad you're going to make that change because it was just so onerous for me as a user to request it. Mm -hmm. But when it comes from you and you've actually considered that you can implement it, that's a far easier, easier option. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, really good. Excellent. Yes, yeah, so this idea of every, you know, together everyone achieves more, right? The classic acronym for team um, is so important, but how do we get there, right? Um, just another quick 
anecdote. I know in our company, we have this situation where we have this crazy guy that comes up with these ideas and you know, that's me. And I'm like, okay, we need to do this. Right. And so I literally have a whiteboard the size of the screen behind my desk. And I just randomly jump up with markers and start scribbling on it. And then I send out emails to people saying, let's do this. And then Michael's like, what are you doing? But we also have another person on our team who's really good at processes. And he says, yeah, yeah, let's do it. But let's not do it that way. Let's, <laughs> let, me, let me work on that for a little bit. And then he comes back later with a process. And we're like, okay, yeah, we actually have a process that, that will accomplish that vision and things like that. And, and that all happens. I mean, we have the fortune of being in a smaller company. Obviously, we're not a Microsoft or we're not a Google where we have thousands and thousands of employees. But so we have the opportunity to actually have these conversations. But having that open environment, having that opportunity to br be able to bring people's skills to bear, everybody has a separate skill that they can bring. And understanding what people have to bring to the table, understanding what their personalities are, what gets them excited and things like that. These are all things that are um, really important in building that teamwork out, building that vision out, uh, and actually being able to complete things to move forward. And we're actually, um, I know Brian's going to talk a little bit even this afternoon about how you do that, how you work with people in their individual um, skills and, and how to draw those skills out of people. Um, Unfortunately, I think a lot of people come to a scenario with, with concern. If, if, if I bring my skills to bear, what's going to happen? Um, are people going to listen to me? Um, if, or, or even on the other side, people are going to listen to me, and then I'm going to find out later on that they took my ideas, and they ran with them, and they, they claimed them themselves. These are all kind of the ugly henchmen of the corporate business world that we all know is out there, but we want to fight against that because all of that is going to be is going to eventually take away from the, from the rocket. All of that's going to take away from the trajectory, from where we want to go and the goals that we want to accomplish. And all of it actually at the end of the day is, is going to take away from governance too. All right. Any quest, other questions or comments on this? It's just such a nice slide. I want to just leave it up there the whole time. Just, are we? No. So when we think about governance, I like to break up governance into two areas. Uh, this is going to be the impact of governance across your enterprise. But as I've worked with people in governance and I've talked to people about governance, I find that it kind of tends to coordinate itself off into two areas that are sometimes very interchangeable, but it's really important to identify the, those two areas. One is in the area of what I call product governance, and then the other is in the area of enterprise governance. So as you have Atlassian come in, oftentimes people come uh, bring Atlassian to their organization through maybe one or two products but eventually they grow, right? Even the person that's bringing in Jira software could very easily in a few months be bringing in Jira service desk. And then all of a sudden, oh, we need portfolio on top of that. Oh, we need, you know, Confluence now. Oh, now we need, we need you know, our, our teams using GitHub and things like that. So we want to start migrating to a Bitbucket environment so that we can work on these collaborative tools. All it takes is one event for somebody to see the aha moment of a collaboration between two Atlassian tools, and they will look for that all the time. And so we have this idea of governance for products. How do we actually manage these products across the company safely and successfully? But then there's also just the general idea of governance in the company as well. Um, what exactly exists in our company as far as governance? Who are the people that are motivating governance? What are some of the things that we've captured already for information around governance that we can actually use as we continue to grow? So those two areas I want to kind of talk about um, and break them out. I'm going to first of all start about start start talking about um, governance for tools themselves. So this may be a little bit specific. Uh, some of the tools you may have in your organization, some of them you may not have. Um, but these are some ideas. Um, really just from things that I've learned uh, uh, over the years talking to different people. So, of course, uh, we've got JIRA. Um, and the interesting thing about JIRA is that when I first work, when start working with somebody with JIRA, um, the concept of a project never even comes up. They, it's just, it was, yeah, it's a project, right? But then, like, all of a sudden, like, many months later or even years later, people start thinking, well, what, what is a project at JIRA? I mean... At, at its crudest level, it's a, it's a field that you fill in, right? So it's something that you can search on in a filter or run a report on. But what exactly is a project? And so part of the governance around JIRA a lot of times 
needs to be the discussion. And sometimes early on, or how are we going to frame up our projects in JIRA? What's a project going to mean to us? Is it going to mean the same thing for our team as it does for this team? Do we want to establish some ideas around our company as to what a project should be as a platform and then maybe grow from there? Um, it becomes, and a lot of times, one of the most simple and yet most complex conversations that you can have in an organization. Do your projects align with your products? Do your projects align with your team? Is there a one-to-one -one relationship between your team and your projects um, or your team and your products? Is it possible to successfully have one project with multiple teams. Can you, if, especially if you're working in an agile environment, can you have three or four teams that are actually meeting and working with issues that are spread across three or four different projects? How does that map out in the form of visualization tools? Um, and then there's this concept of, can we move eventually over time? Maybe not in the beginning, but can we move eventually over time to the point where our projects in JIRA become more evergreen? They're actually things that are standard, stable. Everybody understands what they are. Everybody knows what it is in there. And they, are, they, 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 they remain part of that rocket trajectory. And then teams and issues and other activities are just managed as part of that evergreen process. Um, this is actually a really super important question that has to be discussed at some point if you want to be uh, serious about governance for JIRA. And maybe in the beginning, you're not ready to discuss that. And that's okay. Um, a lot of times in the very beginning, people are just trying to figure out, I don't even know what the difference is between an issue type screen scheme and a field configuration scheme. How am I supposed to tell you what a governance project is, right? And that's fine. But at some point, and hopefully sooner rather than later, there can be that conversation of what, what does a project actually mean for us? And of course, keeping in mind on this, as well as many other things, what a project means for us may be something different than it means for someone else. And what it means for someone else may be something different than it means for these other five teams that right now don't even know what JIRA is. But as JIRA continues to land and expand in our organization, they will soon hear about it and will want to use it for their activities as well. So that's one concept. What's a project, right? The second one about governance in JIRA is, is this, this phrase, but I inherited this mess, right? I, I, it wasn't me. I, I, I just came in here because the other admin built this mess and then he, and then he, and he took off, right? Um, what does that mean for people? How can we support admins as they come in and they're seeing this overwhelming situation? Um, one of the ways we can obviously support them is help them out with just making sure they understand good processes. Um, getting them to a place where they can safely learn about best practices in JIRA and things like that. But really, what kind of standards, what kind of rules do you want to establish as an organization that basically says, if we bring in a new JIRA admin, this is how we're going to support them. If a JIRA admin abandons ship and somebody else comes in, how are we going to get them to the point where they don't leave in two to three months? Because that's like the worst case scenario is every person comes in, they kill themselves for a few months and they're like, it's just not worth it. So what are the governing processes that we can set up in JIRA that actually support these admins as they come in? Um, here's the other side of that. There's some people I talk to that don't want to be an admin. I got inherited in this mess and I don't really want to be an admin. Then there's other people that are, I, I hear talking to my admins that say, I've got these guys that are keep emailing me. They want to be an admin, right? Um, make me, can you make me an admin, please? I'm trying to figure out how to do this in my project and it's just not working out. I, well, you know what? Maybe that particular person is a good person to bring into our governance environment because it seems like they're motivated around Atlassian structures and Atlassian tools. But what is the process? What is the rules and the structure that we want to set up to make sure that every person that asks for admin rights because they want to change this configuration and that scheme and this workflow and all that kind of thing is not just going to get rights right away. So within six months of starting JIRA, you have 100 users and 30 of them are admins. Um, what, and, and there's actually some specific things that we can lay down and talk about that actually say, how do we make sure that happens? What is the avenue? If somebody wants to be an admin, what is the avenue to getting them to be an admin? And also, how can we work with that person to get them to the point, do you really want to be an admin? Do you know what an admin has to go through? Or do you just need this problem solved? And if so, how can we get that problem solved for you? Stop the database dumping. So, um, there is... There is not a person that I have talked to that has been in JIRA for any number of uh, months or years that hasn't told me my database is a mess. And it's this idea of 
There, well, there's a lot of things. There's some specific things, right? Like if you go and create a project in Jira and you do it with a template, it goes and creates about 10 to 12 different database elements right off the bat. And if that particular project is going to match that template exactly, fine. But quite often it doesn't, which means you're now switching out different database elements with other database elements, and those database elements just park there, and they're not being used. Um, even if you create a project and then you're like, oh, whoops, I forgot, I don't need this project, I'm going to delete it. The project goes away, but the database elements stay in there. Jira Service Desk is a very powerful tool. But we found with Jira Service Desk, they take that problem and, they, and it, it multiplies it. If you create a Jira Service Desk project, you will get 15 to 20 database elements that come out of that Jira Service Desk project. Now, it's great if you need those, but what can you do to start working with your policies so that people are not just creating project upon project upon project, and every time they're doing, they're dumping 15 to 20 database elements. So within a matter of months, you have hundreds of database elements. Nobody can find anything in the database, and your performance is bogging way down. And there are things that you can do to specifically lay that out to say, no, that's not the avenue to go. Come over here, look at this project that already exists. When you spin up an instance, one of the first things I do when I work with a company and spin up the instance, before we even invite anybody into the instance, the admin and I will sit down for a day and we'll say, what kind of projects do you want in here? Let's set up a few templates with that. Because you have to, because when you're out of the box, you got to use the templates because there's no existing projects already. What are those templates we can build? Now let's build four or five of those out there. Let those be the templates that everybody else can copy. So in the future, everybody's not recreating all of these database elements. They're just piggybacking off of the templates that we've already built. Things like that. Very tangible things that you can do to not only save your database, but also save your admins from pulling their hair out, especially if they got put back into the situation after somebody has left. And then abandon ship. Like, did, did Steve just really say that? Abandon ship? So I've worked with companies. Um, I've, I've worked with companies that are Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 250 companies. I worked with about a year ago a company that was a Fortune 250 company that had 41 instances of Jira on their, in their co uh, corporation. 41. And I said, you know, do you need all those? And they said, no, what's happened is that because Jira is such a great tool, this group over here st spun one up and this group over here spun one up and this group, and now we've got these 41 instances and we have no idea how to get them all together. And I said, okay, well, you know, we work with people like that. You know, we've done a lot of work with ETL and we can pull stuff out of this instance and put it in this instance and map it together and help you upgrade your instances so they're where they need to be so they can merge and stuff like that. But that takes a really long time. What about this idea? Why don't you just do one instance that is structured with the right governance, with the right organization, with the right structure, and start using that instance with your next project? From people's perspective, oftentimes it's just going from one URL to another URL. They don't really need to have uh, cross information between these two projects. And so you have this new instance that's actually built out correctly and well, while the other instance is just kind of over time, just no longer being used, projects retire and things like that. And so now you have 42 instances, but eventually over time, 40, the first 41 instances can be reduced down to 30 or maybe 25 or 20. And then you can knock down the activity. People don't need them. Yeah, sure. Maybe you need to keep it for auditing purposes. Fine. Give it 10 users, you know, so it's a lower user count. And then you can just park it there. Things like that. Um, maybe sometimes that's the best option. Now, that's a pretty scary thing, like to be the solution. We're just going to abandon ship. But if you have a good governing supporting body that actually lays that out as a possibility, suddenly instead of people saying, well, I got this like, crazy idea. Why don't we just do something right and go from there and start over again? They're actually going to bring that idea to light because the governing body and the governing processes are going to say, you know, in some cases, that might be the best solution to do. So thoughts or questions on our JIRA before I move on? All right. Of course, Confluence. Um, the one thing that's very interesting to me about Confluence is as locked down as in tight and as rigid and as detailed as Jira is. Confluence is almost the opposite, right? So in Jira, you have projects. In Confluence, you have spaces. You can't build a project in Jira unless you're an admin. But if you're uh, a user in Confluence, you can build a space, right? If you've got the permission set up for it. So you have to have this idea with Confluence almost different than admin, uh, with Jira. When I work with people with Jira, I'm dealing usually with one or two persons, and it's very easy to say, okay, these are the, these are the templates we're going to set up. These are the standards we're going to set up in Jira. When I get to Confluence, we have to have this long, we have to have a conversation before we even engage people in Confluence. What is a space in Confluence? 
How broad do we want these spaces to be? Don't forget Confluence is going to be our knowledge-based source. It's going to be the knowledge, our best tool in that rocket uh, on knowledge as far as getting people together and having the shared knowledge and actually promoting knowledge. So we want to make sure that the spaces are structured that way early on. Of course, you have your personal spaces, but what do you want people to do with their personal spaces? Do you want them to actually use those or do you actually want people to be doing those kinds of draft documents or draft activities in another space? Um, divisions. Does it make sense when you, before you actually introduce people into Confluence to actually set up a separate space for every major division in your corporation so that anybody that's new in your corporation can just go to that space and instantly see a bunch of good information that will help them be educated like that on what that division's doing? You have a, you, we we want to promote a lot of cross skills and cross activities. Well, if one person is moving to another team to do some work there, wouldn't it be great if before we actually sit down with them and, and waste about an hour in a meeting explaining to them what our team does, we actually have all that detailed out for them with all of our team's goals and all of our division's goals in a space, and they could actually go have like a different space for different teams and things like that. Um, projects, again, going back to this idea of projects versus teams, that's going to have an effect on how you're going to want to structure your spaces to begin with. We're talking about governance, of course. So why not have a governance space? One location in Confluence where everybody can go and see everything that they need to see about governance. So different things about that. Knowledge dumping versus collaborative content. So we got a lot of knowledge out there, especially if we have a large organization with a lot of users. So how do we put some controls in place? Again, this is the control tower helping the rocket to achieve the best it can so that we don't have hundreds of little dumping grounds of information, but instead we have collaborative content. People know if they have an idea or if they have a document or a blog or a how-to article, they know where to go to put that so that it fits into the rest of the machine and can support everybody else. Um, standardization, right? Confluence is all about do, uh, documents, templates, blueprints. Which of our documents are going to be templates? Which of them are going to be blueprints? Where are those going to live? How are we going to standardize those? Who builds our templates? Are there templates over here from this team that can be used better for that team over there? All of this is, is really important to have uh, open stuff. And then personal, personal content and spaces. You know, do you want to use that or not? What's the impact going to be on personal spaces within your, uh, to your database? Do you want to just open up personal spaces to people that ask for it? I mean, if you have 2,000 users and only 10 people want a personal space, that probably is not going to have a big impact on your database, but it will actually motivate people to get involved in Confluence and learn about Confluence, and maybe they become your Confluence champions down the road. Instead of just saying, no, we're not going to do personal spaces because that's going to kill our database. Well, maybe just give some people the ability to do a personal space. Okay. Portfolio. So portfolio comes on the scene a few years ago and everybody wants it, but nobody understands that portfolio takes about as much time to configure as Jira does, right? And the reason why is because it's not just a, it's not just a chart, right? It's not just a report. It is a tool and it's an intense tool that does a lot of things. It, it actually requires its own set of of, of organization and things like that, making sure that people know what portfolio can do. So for example, one of the biggest things in portfolios is tiers. In Jira, we know that there's not really a lot of hierarchical tools in Jira. Jira wants to be very open-ended and allow people to build things the way they want to. So there's not a lot of hierarchical tools, but when you get into portfolio, there are. So what does this mean? This means that people that have been using Jira for the last five years and suddenly want to use Portfolio now have to go back into Jira first and figure out what the heck they're doing in Jira so that it works in Portfolio, right? And so as a result, we have a lot of tiers, right? Instead of the tiers that we want to build out. Um, And how do you do that, right? Because don't forget, if you're looking in the realm of Portfolio, you're probably looking outside your division as well. As soon as you structure portfolio well, it's going to be your leaders in your company that are going to want to be able to see things. They're going to be want to be able to map your forward capacity, uh, map your, uh, uh, your, your dependencies and things like that. So if you're building out tiers, wouldn't it be great if you could actually have collaborative tiers across different divisions in your organization? So I've got a software division. I've got a PMO division. I've got an HR division. All of them are going to be interested in using portfolio. So, okay, we sit down with them and say, look, guys, you're going to have four tiers in portfolio. You guys sit down and figure out what that looks like. Bring it back to us. Let's collaborate on that. 
If you're in software, you know, maybe you've got the traditional tiers of I got an initiative or maybe a feature or epic or a story or a task. But maybe if you're in PMO, you're looking at something like maybe a division. And then under the division is a position um, or, or a project, I'm sorry. And then under a project, you maybe you have a milestone and then under that you have a task. Um, maybe, in H, maybe in HR, you're looking at the same thing too. You've got a division and then maybe a position and then maybe a candidate or something like that. But these all can be aligned from a governance standpoint if we lay out the framework. Okay, we've got 10 divisions in our company. Most of them never even heard of Atlassian. Two of them are going gangbusters. Let's lay out the framework so that when the other eight hear about it and want to get involved, they already know the steps that they need to start thinking about internally so that when they bring their ideas and their thoughts and their desire to join the party, it's already lined up for us and we can just plug and chug and keep going. Fast iteration, rolling one division in after another. Um, and then... Uh, I like this one. I wonder what this button does. So when, when I first pulled up por portfolio for the first time a couple of years ago and started playing around with it, I noticed this little button up at the top uh, that said something like, submit these changes back. And I was like, yeah, I wonder what this button does. And it, it actually is this situation that once you bl build a plan in portfolio, you can actually adjust the estimates and do a lot of different things in there, which that button will actually take all that information and write it right back into JIRA. Um, so as portfolio grows in popularity in your organization, I mean, you're paying for it for every user. So if you got a thousand users, you're paying, if it's cloud, you're paying $3 and 50 cents for every user to have that more people may want to use portfolio. So how many people do you want to be able to push this button or that button or things like that? Um, this is something that needs to be determined from a governance standpoint. We need to sit down and we need to say, what are these buttons that exist in portfolio? Who can do what and how do we want people to do that? So we don't get, we don't ever want any one of our users in there saying, I wonder what this button does, right? Um, and then, of course, teaming up for success. Portfolio gives us a great opportunity to bring in teams. Teams, how do those teams in portfolio map to your teams in your organization? That's a great conversation to have with, with, uh, with governance in mind as well. Um, and then you've got all the source control tools. So one of the great phrases that I borrowed from Atlassian, and I probably use in almost every time I work with a client, is Atlassian is about autonomy versus visibility. And I don't even know if it's still out there on the website somewhere, but I saw it at a website in Atlassian one time, and I thought, what a fantastic idea. Autonomy versus visibility. Is that not like the ultimate goal of actually maximizing the value of a company? Here we've got a wide array of people that are just digging in, working all day long, trying to get their job done. And what, what should happen to them? But along comes a director who just uh, happens to need to make a report to some shareholders or something like that and just crushes them by asking them, where's this report? I need to know this information. And they're like, what? Okay, fine. I'm going to go burn in a day and a half putting this report together for this director. And then by the time I get back to my job, I don't even remember what I was doing. And the rocket is just kind of dove for about a day and a half, right? Um, so along comes this tool, this fantastic tool, Atlassian. It says, no, 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 no. If you're there working, if you're the person that's actually in the trenches, digging the trenches and building things and making this rocket go, keep doing it. Just keep doing it. We're going to give you a tool where it's going to give you very little uh, effort to come in and do this. Most of it's going to be automated for you. We're ready to rock and roll. You just do that. And then the director over here, we're going to set up a report from him and it's going to feed automatically, right? So whenever we think about Atlassian tools or we think about source control tools, we always want to keep this idea in mind as we're working through governance. What is the autonomy versus the visibility? How much do we want to free up our people that are really doing the work and making this rocket go so that they don't have to waste time trying to do visibility? Like how often is a developer really a, a rock star on building out visibility tools? Maybe, maybe not, but we don't want him to do that. We want him to be a developer. And so what we want to do is we want to sit down from a governance standpoint and say, when we're dealing with these source control tools, let's isolate people as much as we can so they can do their job and then let the tools work for themselves and bring out the reports that we need to. Let Bitbucket manage JIRA through triggers and things like that. So, And keep it simple. Um, simple is always better. Simple is better with workflows. Simple is better with source control. Simple is always your best friend. Um, and I said, keep it simple, my friend, because I just didn't want to call anybody stupid. So I said, keep it simple, my friend, right? And then what are your standards? How are you collaborating these source control tools with different teams? How are you sharing knowledge around the source control tools, best practices, and, and things like that? Okay. So that's what I kind of call governance for 
products. So each product has its own set of benefits and challenges. And you really need to dig in uh, when you're thinking about governance and figure out how do we maximize the value of these tools, not just for one team, but for all teams, not just for teams now, but for teams in the future as well. And in addition to this, um, we also have to think about the broader governance because everything we just talked about is not going to happen unless you have a, uh, a culture of governance that's already been established, something that's been structured. And so what are some of those things that have to happen? Now, when we think about governance, our mind can go in a lot of different directions. So what we've tried to do is we've tried to corner in key ideas about what we call enterprise governance so that we can actually look at those partially so we don't forget something. When I work with a client on governance, a lot of times I talk to them and as I'm going, I'm getting excited about this, that, and the other. And quite often I wind up forgetting something because um, uh, there's just so much stuff to talk about. But if you can kind of just highlight it on maybe five or four or, or six different main categories, it gives you a really good uh, way of making sure that you don't leave anything behind so that as you get down the road and you're successful, you realize, oh, we should have done this. Um, so one of the first things that that really matters, of course, is your policies. Um, so for example, what are your basic uh, rules and standards around people versus tool relationships? Uh, I'll give you a classic example. Um, how well are you using in JIRA groups versus roles? And how is that tying into your broader corporate requirements around managing people? Um, things like this, in confluence, how are, how are we setting up people in confluence? These are really important discussions that have to happen, not just at the product level, but across the board because we're growing across teams. So what are the, what are the relationships that we want to establish uh, for future success around people and tools? Um, how about training requirements? Um, we're bringing in hundreds and hundreds of people. One of the best things about training is it not only helps people use the tool, it gets people excited about the tool. So in our JIRA bootcamp class, which I did earlier this week, it without fail, there's going to be a period of time in the class, it's different for everybody, but there's gonna be a period of time in the class where I see the students say, oh my gosh, now I know how to do this, or now that makes sense. So I've just given them a tool to go back and help them in the company, but I've also just made them a, a loyal JIRA fan for the next few months until they run into the next major problem that they're frustrated with, right? But it excites people about it. And so if you're going to have a growing environment, if we know that Atlassian is growing as a company and it's growing as a company because in our companies, we're seeing growing users, can we then set up some governance protocols that say, hey, yeah, we are gonna need some more admins eventually. So let's get ahead of the curve. When we move from 500 users to 1,000 users, maybe we need to bring in another JIRA admin. So if we know we're gonna do that, let's make sure that we have a process in place that says, as we grow here, we're gonna need these admins. And then a few months before that, we're gonna send that admin to a boot camp or something like that and get them prepared. So what are the standards that you wanna set up around training and getting people so that they can successfully use the tool? Um, What's the process for an individual, one person, right, in the microcosm of the rocket to promote or, or, or eventually purchase something in Atlassian that they need? Uh, nothing uh, will get somebody more excited than when they find something that's useful for them or what they're trying to accomplish, and they're like, this is what I've been looking for. I'd love to use this. And then nothing will kill that enthusiasm more than saying, well, buddy, I'm sorry, we've got a governance process and it's only on the 5th of May that they're, you know, that the governance emperor has, you know, deigns to walk among the people and ask them what add-ons they would like to purchase, right? No, what if that person goes to Confluence and he's like, I've got this awesome idea for an add-on. I'm gonna go to the Confluence page and space that I already know about and I'm gonna pull down the policies that I already know exist on how to purchase an add-on and I'm gonna follow those processes. Now you're taking his empowerment and you're allowing it to move into the company and allow that rocket to continue to, to travel. In addition to that, everybody else that's involved in the process knows exactly what he's doing. Bob over here has got a great idea for an add-on. Oh, he's just going through the normal process that we all go through whenever we want to build an add-on and things like that. Um, what defines the enterprise's governance processes or the change management? Everything that we're talking about today. What are those? Are those documented? Are those identified? Have they been discussed? Um, are they, are they um, dynamic? 
there's no reason, especially, and we'll talk about this a little bit today, when you build out a governance process using Atlassian tools, it gives you the power to have dynamic governance processes. And so what are some of these processes and have they been identified? Have they been communicated out to everybody? What's your policy for governing policies? Um, what policies support healthy, healthy governing bodies? What are your requirements going to be, your policies around governing bodies? Your governing bodies are going to be your framework. We'll talk about this in a second. That actually manage your governing policies. But the people that managing the governing policies, just like you, you know, you want all you want all subjects to be uh, to be under the law. You don't want anybody to be above the law. So the same thing. Even if you build governing bodies, you still need those governing bodies to understand that there's policies for governing bodies. So those are governing policies. That's, that's one kind of big area that you want to really focus on, figure out where you're going. And this is going to be very dynamic. It's going to grow and change as you grow and change as an organization. Because when you first start off, you can't possibly think of all the policies that you're going to eventually need. So just best practices. I mean, this is this is fantastic tool. So I call this a governance thing, although really it's just it's it's what's going to cause your rocket to really go well, have high fuel efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. What are the best practices? How do you draw those best practices out of people? How do you have those hard conversations around best practices? What's the best way to build and structure a sufficient, strong, but limited Atlassian admin team? This is the probably the number one best practice that we work with people. Um, and, and I see it on both sides. I see people that there's one admin for a thousand users because all of the users and all of the uh, leaders in the organization don't understand what it takes, how different it is to admin or to manage a JIRA or a Confluence uh, instance when you have a thousand users versus it was when you had five or 10. Um, and, and the other thing too is I see people there, they're managing large instances, but they're also acting as project managers. At a certain point, that you you got to cut the umbilical cord, right? That, that those are two different groups, right? And then I see the other side of the equation where we've got a lot of a lot of users, but then like a very high percentage of admins, and so everybody's out there in the database, and nobody really knows what's going on. So, what's the best mix there for that? It's different for every company, depending on what your company does, how big your company is, and things like that. That's a best practice. Define that. Write it down. Put it somewhere. Best practice to structure your Lassian environment. Um, this is, we're going to get into this later this afternoon when you're talking about building the structure that your environment lives on. So it's, it's kind of funny. One of the things that really motivated this entire governance structure and governance discussion that we had is as I talked to people, I used to have this old janky slide that was like a house and, and in the house were different rooms and the different rooms were the different uh, uh, products that Atlassian had. And, and now it's kind of out of date because it still has hip chat and, 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 and stride in there. And then underneath it was like the foundation and the foundation was the where, like where does your Atlassian live? Is it data center? Is it cloud? Is it AWS? Is it Microsoft Azure? You know, where does it live, right? And then over on the right side, I'd have the who. Who are the people in your in your world that manage the Atlassian universe, and and who are and, you know what roles do they play and stuff like that? And and this was just a diagram that I put together based on the conversations I'd have with people. But as soon as I'd show it and start talking through it, people would like jump on me, and they say, "Can you give this to my boss?" You know, I go, why? Well, because I used to be this, and now I'm all of these, and I need to just be this here and stuff like that. And so. One of the conversations that would come out of that all the time is the where side, the foundation side. Where does your Atlassian live? Um, whether you're in the cloud or whether you're in data center or wherever you are, um, it's important to understand this, to, how to safeguard your environment, how to protect your environment. Are, you know, are we going to have a, a test and a prod environment? Are we going to have a QA environment? Now, one of the really good things about best practices here is I'm talking about where your platform lives, and I'm also talking about how do you create a successful environment for admins and things like that, right? So one of the things that you can do to save your admins, especially as your user count grows, is give the other people that really have a lot of responsibilities in Atlassian tools their own instance to play around with, right? So if you've got a project manager that every day is hounding an admin about, build this project for me, build that project for me, have a QA or a test environment where those guys can go and play around so that at the end of the day, it's up to the project manager and their teams to build out the projects, to test the projects, then bring them to the admin and say, this tests really well in our group, okay? And we've also, because we have the policies in place, we've also are pretty much in compliance with your, with your structures that you've laid out for us from a governing standpoint. 
Now all the admin needs to do is take the 20 or 30 minutes it takes to load that into the production environment. Okay, best ways to promote good governance across your enterprise. These are, these are kind of um, intangibles, right? These are kind of subjective things. We want to build a governance structure. We want it to be a good governance structure. But what's the best way to actually promote that? Once you learn, once an event happens, once you've got a nice anecdote, that actually can be documented and captured so that people down the road can remember. These are little like milestones that we build for people in the future to know we were really successful in implementing this because we did this thing or this event happened or we tried this and it worked really well. Those are all can become best practices in how to continue to promote your, your governing and your healthy governance. Um, best ways to promote Atlassian training, education, exploration, future best practices. All of those things should be documented as best practices. It should not be a mystery to users if they want to go to training, how they go about doing that. If they want to buy an add-on, how they go about doing that. All of that should be documented as, as best practices for them. So best practices. So we have Atlassian policies as a general idea, and then we have Atlassian best practices as a, a general idea. And then, of course, the governing bodies. There is no governance without the governing bodies. But when we say that, a lot of times, some of us cringe internally because we're like, I, I, this just hampers things. This is the tower uh, dragging the rocket down, right? And so how do we really work to, uh, to, to avoid that from happening? What is your governance structure? What's important for you in a governance structure? Who's in each governing body and why? That's a really important question because that's going to help you leapfrog this whole idea of top-down governance or dictatorial governance and get you to a point where your governance and your governing structure is grassroots-based and user-based. What's the purpose and activity for each governing body? Identify that. Include it in that. Identify how those governing bodies can be efficient, right? We need you. You're a great user. You're a great expert in this particular area. We need you in this particular governing body. I don't have time for that. That's fine. It doesn't take any time, right? It's it literally, we don't have any meetings scheduled. It's all right here. You just need to check it out. And then occasionally we need to read something, review something and talk about something. But you know, how do you structure those purposes and activities for those governing bodies so you can set the framework early on so that those governing bodies are not onerous to people that are involved in them? How do you promote user engagement within the governing bodies? How do you get the people that should be in the governing bodies in the governing bodies? How do you actually get people to um, want to be in the governing bodies? So one of the things that I do outside the world of XBM and Atlassian is I am uh, the committee chairman for our local Cub Scouts. And the number one responsibility for a committee chairman of, uh, of a local Cub Scouts is to find volunteers and drag them in. And, and so what I try to do is I try to figure out unique ways to get people involved into our, our community. Um, and, and we were losing our Cub Master, which if you know anything about Scouts, is a very important role. And so I was viciously looking around for a new Cub Master before our old one left. And where should I happen to find one but at the Pinewood Derby, which is this major annual event that happens with the Scouts. And his, his, my son's car and his son's car both made it to districts. So we're there at districts. And of course, we're talking to it. I didn't even know him, but we're talking to each other because we're from, from the same pack. And as I get to talk to this guy, I realize this guy's involved. He's excited about Scouts. Scouts. His kids love Scouts. He's at this, he's at this district event. I wonder if he would be a good person to start grooming as, as, a, as a Cub Master for me going forward. And so I started talking to him about it. And it's the same idea of finding people where they're interested. If somebody is interested in add-ons and they're always interested in add-ons, then maybe they're the best person to actually help build and manage your governing policies around purchasing add-ons and things like that. Please. What's that? I do. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm almost done. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So the question was, do I have any examples of governing bodies? And, and exactly, I've got a couple more slides here. Then we're going to take a break. And then the next section is actually going to be a layout of, of um, a case study on governing bodies with, with examples and things like that. So yeah, great question. Um, okay. So what's the expectation, of course, of each governing body? What's their meeting cycle? What, you know, what does each body do? Who talks to what bodies, depending on what things they need to get done? So governing bodies. So we have policies, best practices, and governing bodies. I think we've got two more here. The governing framework. So this is something we're going to talk a lot about later this afternoon. But the question is, wouldn't it be great if like Atlassian 
We're, we're, we're just, we're going gangbusters in Atlassian. We got tons of users. It's growing. Everybody loves it. Wouldn't it be great if Atlassian had a tool where we could document governing structures and policies? Hmm, let me think about that for a second. Oh, yeah, maybe they do. Oh, wouldn't it be great if we actually had a tool where we could track all of the governing policies and events? Like, you know, like a tool where like when something needs to be done, it goes through a workflow and it actually has activity. Wait a minute, we might have that too. Wouldn't it be great if all of these tools were actually visible across all teams, right? So that it could not only be managed from the top down, but it could actually be managed and viewed and acted on by users. Oh, well, maybe, maybe we have that too, right? So governing framework, actually, this is what I like the most about doing governance with Atlassian. Most of the principles we talk about today could be applied to any type of software product that you have in your organization. But the thing I really like about doing it with Atlassian is it not only helps you understand the governing policies and principles and best practices, it gives you the framework that you need to do with all of this. So we're actually going to take a section, an entire section this afternoon, and talk to you guys about how you can actually use the governing uh, the, the, the Atlassian tools themselves to build the frame out for the governing process that you need to build out. So I won't go into a whole lot more. That, that'll just kind of be my, my tease for later this afternoon. So uh, governing bodies, governing framework, uh, governing policies and governing best practices, and then finally, how-to articles. Um, so how do you make on onboarding more efficient? So I'm working with companies now where we have uh, anywhere between 500 to several thousand users. They want to implement Jira across their platform. We want to do it in a, in a controlled way, as we've been discussing, one that's going to help people stay motivated, but still keep the rocket on track. And so what are some of the ways that we can make onboarding more efficient? What are some of the how-to articles that we can provide to people? So we're going to implement a project. We're going to train users, and then those users are going to jump into some sort of agile scrum project in Jira. Well, how do they get from the training where they learned how to use the software as a user into getting their project running? Well, how about a how-to article that they can go to and say, now that you've gotten training, how do I start my project? And they can just go there and they, this is who you talk to, and this is the information you need to provide them and things like that. Um, of course, promoting knowledge sharing across the enterprise. Anybody that learns anything should be trying to put our, um, trying to put artifacts together so that it can be shared and replicated. Promote and reward expertise and research. This is something I think um, a lot of companies don't do nearly as well as they should. There is a cost to rewarding uh, expertise and research and training, but I think even though it may not be hard to draw the linear line, I think there is definitely a greater value than there is a cost to it. Um, most people that I see leaving on the last day of our training are taking with them tangible things that they've built into the uh, training instance. They're taking away with them exciting ideas that they've never seen before. They've had conversations with five or 10 other people in the class and have networked with them around solutions that they're having. I will have, usually by the second or third day of my class, I will have students talking to each other, helping each other and consulting each other on things because everybody is excited about this. Those are actually gems of opportunities. Yeah, it costs some money to do it, but put together some policies and put together some how-to articles. What if I'm frustrated because I wanna do this, this, and this, and this, and I just can't quite get there. Maybe I want to do some training. But maybe as an individual user, I'm one of a thousand and I don't really know how to get that done. But maybe I can go to a document that tells me that's been written by my governing bodies. If you want training, this is how you do it. If you want expertise, this is how you do it. If you came up with a great idea, guess what? Once a month or once every two months, we're going to have a session for an afternoon where we're going to bring in, maybe make it at five o'clock. We're going to bring in some beers or whatever. And people are just going to share great ideas that they came up with across the organization over the last month or two. These kinds of activities are incredibly valuable, but it only works if when people have the idea, they can trigger on it then. If you send them a notice that say, hey, guess what? Next month, we're going to do this. People may not have those ideas when they read that notice, and so they may just kind of file the email and not forget, and not even think about it. But if they have an idea, and as soon as they have an idea, they're like, I'd love to share this, and they know where they can go to find the how-to article to talk about when the next event is going to be and things like that, then they can start planning for it and thinking about it. Build a, big, uh, a habit of good knowledge, documentation, organization, searchability. Um, what are the, you know, what are the how-to articles to train people on how to search for things that they need to search for? Uh, captions, less, uh, lessons learned the first time and promote that knowledge across the teams. 
uh, create an opportunity for people to want to capture and document artifacts. I don't know what that could be, you know? Uh, Confluence has this really fun thing called questions for Confluence that whenever somebody is frustrated, they can dump a question out into your Confluence space. Other people can jump in and answer it and everything. And then the person who asked it and other people can vote it up or down and you get these points. And it's really kind of funny. We do this in our Confluence bootcamp. I'm like, okay, everybody go out and ask a question. All right, now everybody go out and answer the question. Now everybody go vote on it. And then we like click and you can see the experts. Well, this Bob was the expert for this class because he got the most votes or, and things like that. It, it's kind of silly, but in a way it takes it to the level where it's a little bit more fun and people start to get motivated about um, uh, building out different documents and tools that they need to do so that you now have this knowledge base of how-to articles that's growing and growing and growing and also manageable and searchable in your organization. Okay, so how-to articles as well. So when we think about all of these different things together, there's a lot here, right? Now, so I've been up here talking for a while, so I'm going to let you guys take a break and, and kind of uh, clear out your heads a little bit. But I'm not really here to solve your individual problems right now. I'm here to get you thinking. I'm here to throw some ideas out there. And I, I can tell you 99.9% .9 of the things that I'm talking to you today have come from other people. So I am implementing in my own life of working with Expium and Atlassian, the governing principles I'm talking about of calling this information and then displaying it back out to other people. And I do this all the time. Hopefully some of the things, ideas that I've thrown out this morning have gotten you thinking about things that you could do better, or maybe you are doing already and you're like, yeah, that's great. That's a good attaboy. We actually got that. We're actually doing that right now. Um, and maybe start to build a framework around that. So not only do you have the value and the data and the information and the content out there, but you actually have it structured because you don't want people just having to feel like they got to look in a dictionary for a word, but they actually know where different things are depending on what they're dealing with, what successes they've had, what frustration they've had, what things they need and things like that. In order to, again, uh, promote and, and escalate that rocket with uh, representation, openness, coordination, knowledge, expertise, and, and teamwork. So, okay, so let's take uh, maybe a 10 minute break. Um, and then we are going to, you know, hit the restroom, get some snacks, uh, reset the video or whatever. And we are going to come back. And the next thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about how to build a healthy structure with governing bodies.